uncharacteristic of one of your reputation. Show immediately reminds me that Werner Herzog is no longer going to be playing a character in it. And for making me sad, it gets a sin. A f bunch of logos that tell me that I'm watching a Star Wars property, in case I already didn't know. Yo, I know we need to see this wretched hive of scum and villainy, but can we get on with it? This walk is taking longer than Sir Lancelot's run up to Swamp Castle. Oh look, a Banksy. Oh, let's get ready to Gamorrean Grumble! Also, I'm pretty sure this fight sequence is only here because Jon Favreau has a boxing ring boner. And far be it for me to criticize another person's boner, but really means f all to the rest of this episode. I'm told you know where to find them. Man, they sure are able to have this conversation in hushed tones despite the raging crowd all around them. <laughs> Cheating. These scruffy looking nerf herders seriously try to get into a fist fight with a f***ing Mandalorian, despite seeing him ice all those henchmen seconds ago. Also, why would anyone punch Mando in his helmet? Why would anyone punch anyone's helmet? It's a f***ing helmet! I know Mando has the armor and has a few weapons, but in the previous episodes, I don't recall him being f***ing Inspector Gadget. I've spent much time on Tatooine. I've never seen a Mandalorian there. I feel like we've all spent way too much time on Tatooine in this franchise. There's a ton of world out there left to explore, but yeah, let's go back to Luke's boring planet again. Cut me down! That wasn't part of the deal. No, but you did say... I promise you will not die by my hand. And I'm pretty sure that was your hand that fired the blaster and allowed all the wild mutts to come kill Gore Koresh. What the f*** is up with this score? Sounds more like the ending to Jingle All the Way than an episode of The Mandalorian. Sorry, gang! Come on! You know he doesn't like droids! I'm sure Peli Motto might recall Mando's dislike of droids, but they've only met once, and she's acting like this is a lifetime of experiences they share together. So he likes droids now. Well, you heard him. Give it a once-over. Just because IG-11 sacrificed itself in the previous episode, Mando's cool with all droids now? It's like me meeting Mark Cuban and deciding all rich white men are okay. I just can't get good help anymore. I don't even know who to complain to. I love Amy Sedaris, and I appreciate the humor in this episode. I also think that these characters wouldn't talk like this. Sorry. I think the show is trying to jam in hokey dialogue as a throwback. But the worst part of those classic movies was the hokey dialogue. You got Mos Eisley. Most Espa and Upper on this region, most Pelgo. Yeah, but what happened to most Def? I miss that guy much more than most Pelgo. I have to say, this is so like an old school Western that I have to take a sin off. It's comforting and exciting and suspenseful all at the same time. And for capturing that classic feeling, remove the sin. But also, these townsfolk are totally giving away the fact that their marshal has Mando armor. If they'd just gone about their business, he probably would have moved on and not caused any trouble. These town folks are dicks to their leadership, man. Considering Mando keeps telling everyone he has been quested to take care of the child, he sure does just leave it behind a lot where it could easily be kidnapped or killed. Why wouldn't he have just left it with Peli Motto? She's taken good care of it in the past. Okay, I understand the homage to westerns, but did that sound like actual f***ing spurs? Play it again. Ain't no f***ing spurs on that costume, man. If you're gonna go this over the top, just give him a poncho and a cigar for f***'s sake. Cue fanboys orgasms now. I figure only one of us walking out of here. But then I see the little guy, and I think, maybe I pegged you wrong. Assumptions. Round here, I'm the one who tells folks what to do. Round here, I'm the one who tells folks to do, cliche. Take it off. And do it nice and slow, all sexy-like. Isn't it about the time that the bartender crawls beneath the counter? I mean, he's pretty much directly in the line of fire. It's really nice of this underground creature to make its way through town in a straight path and right through the center so as not to destroy any of the buildings. Also, show does not have a no banthas were harmed during this production warning. Comparisons. The town was on its last legs. It started after we got news of the Death Star blowing up. The second one, that is. Celebrating the deaths of all those innocent independent contractors. Also, what is up with this episode having impossible conversations in extremely loud environments? And then I was saying. Wait, he just noticed this now? How did he not see that giant automobile in the distance a long time ago? My treasure bought me more than a full water skin. It bought my freedom. But only because the miners went to the stormtrooper school of aiming at things and didn't shoot you in your arm, neck, stomach, or legs. Timothy Bobafant. Also, I don't know what's more surprising, that the Jawas had Mandalorian armor, or that they had a helmet that fit Cobb Vanth so perfectly. What am I supposed to do with this? You drink it. It stinks. Hey, the Tusken Raiders have their own version of Malort. I bet there's a subreddit devoted to Raider face. Now, how do we kill it? If he could speak English while making the hand gestures and they still understood what he was saying, then what were all the grunts about? 
But also, the fact that the show took the time to hire a deaf actor to create this Tuscan sign language for Raider Nation is pretty cool and worthy of a sin-off. They say it lives in there. Didn't Cobb already know that, though? He brought Mando all the way out here, didn't he? This here is a Mandalorian. You know what that means? Oh, we've heard the stories. Then you know how good they are at killing. But he doesn't, because he just said he's only heard stories. Maybe do a little more listening discount, Raylan Givens. A crate dragon has been peeling off our pack animals and sometimes taking our mining hall with it. I know this is a bothersome phenomenon, but it doesn't sound like the dragon has been killing anyone in the town. In fact, the greater threat to the livelihoods of this town are the Tusken Raiders themselves. So why is Cobb willing to risk his greatest asset in combat to get rid of this annoyance? Sure, Mando could kill him, but he's risking the entire town to combat something that isn't really the biggest threat to his community. This Tusken Raiders meets the people of Mos Pelgo scene goes on for some time. What are you trying to blow the whole place up? Nice. Wouldn't be a traditional Western TV episode without a protagonist fight amongst themselves before the final act of the show cliche. Cheese and crackers, there's more unnecessary walking in this episode than in the entirety of the Lord of the Rings franchise. Sure, now is the best time to take a drink of this foul juice. Does he even know if it's nutritious or it f you up like peyote? The Tuscans say the belly is the only weak spot. I guess that would be a fair assumption, but since they've never killed one of these, how do they know that? Sand people yell at this dragon to wake him up when he's peacefully hibernating, and did I miss who the actual antagonist is here? This f***ing plan. I'm gonna hit it. No, wait. We only have one shot. Then maybe it would have been a good idea to set the charges closer to the entrance of the cave? By the way, nice job helping with this f***ing operation, Mr. Being who could probably end this evil bastard by waving your hands a few times before multiple people were killed. I don't think it's dead. Well, not with that attitude, it's not. Let's get after it. Yes, after we've stood on the sidelines while this futile explosive trick was tried and failed. We can do it! There he is. Yeah, but how? How did he get from the top of the mountain to here without any one of you knowing? I don't know. The Beskar armor is impervious to the dragon goo, and he survived being swallowed by that and this explosive worked, even though the other one didn't. And I guess this is a long-winded way of saying Mando survives this. Hey, what a twist! It's that guy! And yeah, yeah, I know that everyone thinks it's Boba Fett because of the actor or whatever, but some of us that just watch this show haven't witnessed every single piece of Star Wars history multiple times. So this isn't a twist to us. It's just confusion about why I'm watching this random ball guy look at the sunsets. Oh, Johnny, I apologize. I forgot you were there. You may go now. Do you hear the ding in your head when you watch movies? I hear it all the damn time, especially around the holidays, and I'm done hiding my damn dings. I'm going to wear them proudly, like a goddamn YouTube Grinch. If you want to do the same, you can grab this limited edition monstrosity from our store. Merry dingmas, everyone. You ain't so bad. You ain't nothing. Come on. You must be crazy or something. I'm crazy. You're just a stupid Yeah, maybe you stupid. Might Kill him. Finish him. Easy with that face of me. Oops. Oh, what? What? I hope I didn't stain my underwear. You're making a terrible mistake. I'm not going to let you make. Come on, guys. Nobody wants this. We're supposed to be f***ing professionals. Surprise, Sydney. Traveled from villages near and far. Lend me your ears. That's disgusting. There's no easy way out. There's no shortcut home. Feed me! Why are my drippings with poo? Pan down from the twin sons of Tatooine after a beat, the gloved Mandalorian armor gauntlet of Boba Fett grabs onto the sand outside the Sarlacc pit, and we realize uh, that he survived his fall uh, during the battle at Jabba's uh, palace ship. 